Hi there, welcome back to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel and uh, I must say I in this teaching that I'm going to do I was really thinking of you know Father what would you like me to um, title this teaching and it was between purity of heart and sabotaging your call and um, at, and at the end it boils down to the same so um, I'm thinking, I'm still not sure what to call it, but I'm leaning towards sabotaging your call. And um, in this teaching, I will be speaking about um, or building upon the two dreams that I've interpreted for Sister Donna with regards to um, the one was the Father of Lights, or the Tree of Lights and the Father of Lights, that dream, that interpretation that had to do with um, the gifts that people covered um, of the Holy Spirit rather than seeking his face and um, also the persecution that comes um, to those who actually are called by God and that is in the second dream the one where she is flipping the tables like Jesus um, where there is big coins on the tables um, that represent the people trafficking, trafficking with the gifts of God and then the coming persecution she mentions the black horse rider and the famine. So um, I think it's quite important that if you haven't listened uh, or watched those two interpretations, that you do watch it even before you watch this. Um, because, you know, even in this teaching, I will be giving two visions. I will be speaking about two visions and that Father has given me and three dreams. Uh, one dream is of somebody else, but three dreams as well. Now, why do fathers speak in dreams and visions? Why not just give it to us straight? And I, I believe that not everybody is given dreams and visions, and that's okay. Um, but for some, he does give dreams and visions. And so we, we need to ask why. Why not just tell us plainly that we may know? And I think one of the reasons is, is the same reason why Yeshua spoke in parables. He told his disciples, I've, I think it's in John 5, or John 5 or 6, could be 6, where he said, I've got many things to say to you, but you are unable to bear them. And sometimes he gives us dreams and visions because it forms a picture in our mind. So when I say the word apple, most people immediately in their mind's eye see an apple. And dreams and visions have multiple layers and dimensions to it. So sometimes it can be very specifically one thing, but often it means multiple things. So um, there's a lot of depth with regards to dreams and visions. And a lot of things can be said. So if you just think of um, the book of Revelations, um, the symbolic meanings of everything, mostly dreams are symbolic. Um, not 100% of the time, but mostly they are symbolic. So they, they carry uh, the word, the, the, the saying is, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. So the dreams and visions have about a thousand words, so to speak. Okay, so he's, he says a lot to us through them. So I will be building on what Sister Donna has dreamed, and then I will also talk about these two visions and the three dreams. So let's start um, as well. I'll be giving a word that Father has given that sums up his heart and intention and exhortation to us who have it ear to ear what he has to say in this teaching. So I'll be st shooting straight in this teaching. Um, I have been judged by Father by the very word that I will be speaking here. So I pray that you will hear what he has to say. Are you sabotaging your calling? So let's go to scripture and this scripture it forms the foundation or the base of this whole teaching and that's in James 1 and we're going to start from verse 2. So you can just get your Bible, we will read from there. James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have its perfect way or work in you, that ye may be perfect, entire, and wanting nothing. So we're just going to start with these first three verses and just look at them. James starts here by addressing our faith that needs to be tested. And he says the way 
that's tested is by diverse temptations. Now these diverse temptations are both trials and temptations. Okay, both trials. Both of them try our faith. But then he tells us that we need to have patience. Now that word patience, when you go into the Strongs, it means endurance, to be fortified, to see it through. Don't give up okay, in that time that you are going through it. So he says we have to allow patience to have uh, uh, to have her work, perfect work in us. In other words, it's a process until it reaches its perfection. So through every trial and temptation, he is working something in you, but you have to endure so that patience will have her perfect work in you. Okay, but that perfect work, what it will bring forth, saying that it will, it, you may be perfect, that you may be entire, and that you will want nothing. Now that's something worth to endure for, isn't it? Okay, so the the words wanting nothing drew my attention to Psalm 34 because at the heart of it, he wants us to be in that place where his work, his work in us that we will lack nothing, that we will want nothing because he is our source. Okay. So let's go to Psalm 34 and we read what it says there. Verse 9. O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. So here immediately you see that what this patience is working in you is the fear of God. And when he has perfected that in you, you will want nothing. When he has perfected that fear in you, you will want nothing. This tense says, the young lions lack, do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Then it says in verse 11, Come ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So first thing we need to realize is that when we are tested and tried, our faith is tried, we have to allow patience to have its perfect work in us so that we will want nothing. And what it's working in us is the fear of God. And so here David says, come ye children, and I will teach you the fear of God. So what is the fear of God? And he says here, verse 12, what man is he that desireth life? And loveth many days, that he may see good. Keep thy tongue from evil, and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. So here he is saying, if you want to know what the fear of the Lord is, then you need to come as a child. Come ye children. And I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And then he starts addressing the issue of guile. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. And then to depart from evil, do good and seek peace and pursue it. So evidently, the fear of God is vitally linked to our lips. What we confess, what we speak, whether there is guile on our lips or not. So, when we go to Psalm 32, building upon that, verse 2, it says, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Verse 9 says in Psalm 32, Be ye not as the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth has to be held in with bit and bridle, lest it comes near to thee. Okay, so the first thing you see here in Psalm 32 verse 2, it says that, and in whose spirit there is no guile. So what you find here is that guile reaches down to the spirit. Now we are spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. So this guile is not just something general sin. It is to the very root of who you are. That's where it's seated. 
And the Lord is saying he's seeking those who will not speak with guile and who will not have any guile within their heart or in their spirit. Okay, verse 9 addresses the mouth. And remember in the uh, two Johns, I think it was in two Johns or was it in Acts? Um, I think it was in two Johns, uh, two Johns and a Jezebel. I, I, I showed through scripture referencing Issachar how the priests of the Lord are referred to as his donkeys or his mules, right? And here he says he's speaking to those priests, those who have a calling upon their life. He's saying to them, be ye not as the horse or the mule, who, um, which have no understanding, so understand, um, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto you. So in other words, he wants to say, I don't want to always have to manipulate your mouth, keep you to shut up, because you do not have an understanding what guile is within your heart. But rather I would want you to know my every move as I sit on you. And you being my workhorse and worker. To know which direction I want you to move in. Don't be stubborn and want to go in your own direction. Okay. So we always say as stubborn as a mule. And you see the reference of... Um, this guilelessness in Revelations 14, where it talks about um, the 144,000 that are without guile. We also find Nathaniel in uh, John 1 or 2, I'm not sure, that Yeshua found him under the fig tree. And Yeshua, when he met up with him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite who is without guile. So we have two examples of the 144,000. Um, and they are said to be virginal, they virgins, so they are pure, they are innocent, they are as lambs, they are as children, innocent. Okay, so before I go on, I want to talk about this dream that Father gave to me plus minus eight years ago, and where he spoke to me about the calling upon my life, and I want you to take careful notice of uh, uh, um, just what he, the interpretation of it is and how it applies to you who have been called. Okay, so this is a dream of an eagle that he gave me. In this dream, I was in my bedroom and I saw coming down the hallway, I saw Yeshua approaching me and he, um, I couldn't see his face but I knew it was him and he was wearing uh, a light brown robe. And as he came into the room, I saw in the corner, the ceiling, I saw a very small black spider. And I grabbed a broom and I wanted to just get rid of the spider, but I couldn't get the spider. And the next moment, I was standing by a table next to Yeshua. And I saw in his hand that he was holding an eagle. And this eagle was had all the features of a full-grown eagle. But the only thing is that it was able to fit in his hand just like that. He was holding this eagle, but it's a fully grown eagle. And then I saw right next to us an American bald eagle in a showcase, glass showcase, right next to us. And it was looking to the front, it was facing forward, but its eye was so big, it was exaggerated, it was almost as big as a small saucer. That's how big the eye was, and it was looking straight at us. And the next moment, Yeshua took this little eagle and broke its neck, and I heard the crack, it actually went through me. So, uh, 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 that dream was so real to me. And the eagle he placed, that little eagle he placed on, or the small eagle he placed on the table. And with the neck broken, I saw yellow bile coming out of its mouth. And that was the end of the dream. And that's quite a dream to have. So this is the interpretation. I just want to read it so I don't forget anything. This dream is about the calling on my life. An eagle has 20-20 vision and points to the ability to see or discern in the spirit. Yeshua dressed in the light brown robe points to sackcloth 
and being humble of spirit. The spider is pointing to guile. It was particularly small to show me that this is not easily noted with the heart, which is my bedroom. So the, the bile is a play on words with guile. Okay, so the spider is pointing to guile. It was particularly small to show me that it's not easily noted within the heart, which is my bedroom. So the bedroom symbolizes my heart. The spider symbolizes guile. And that is not easily notable, right? The small eagle has all the right features of a grown eagle. But in truth, it is anemic and sick. It looked sick. And there is no hope for it. It has to die. It has been poisoned by the small spider. The bile coming out is a play on words as bile points to guile. It comes out of the mouth of the small eagle showing the guile found in the gift and office given. Unless he deals with it, that which is in the showcase, the 2020 vision, the exaggerated eye vision, will not be mine. The showcase is to show me what he has purposed for my life. It will remain only a showpiece unless he breaks the neck of the small eagle, that is to say, remove all guile from my mouth. Okay, Obadiah 1 verse 3 and 4 says, The pride of thy heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock like an eagle, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Verse 4, thou, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest amongst the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. So what we've discussed now is James 1, the first part where James talks about the faith being tried, that we need to have patience, because patience causes us to reach that point of wanting nothing. And wanting nothing points to the fear of God, which is that of not having any guile on our lips or in our spirit. Okay, and that's why the dream was given to me. So going back to James 1 again, we read further from verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Okay, so if you lack wisdom, he will give it to you. He will give it to you liberally. He will not keep anything back, and it will be given to you. Verse 6, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So first you have James addressing faith that is fortified and strengthened, and then he's addressing faith that is weak, that is double-minded, that is like a wave being tossed to and fro. And take into context what we are speaking about. We are speaking about, are you sabotaging your call upon your life? So let's see what he is saying here verse 9 let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted but the rich in that he is made low because of the flower of the grass he, fa he shall pass away then we go to verse 12 because blessed is the man that endureth temptation in other words that sees through this trial and testing of his faith for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life which the lord hath promised to them that love him okay so remember i said this temptation comes through trials and being tempted by the enemy okay it's not the lord that tempts us but we'll get to that later how that happens so let's look at these three points. These are the three points that I'm going to address in this teaching. The man of low degree, the rich, and temptation. Okay, the man of low degree, the rich, and temptation. Then we go to verse 17. 
every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So the first thing you need to notice here is the first two words given here. Every good gift and every perfect gift. So evidently there is something like a good gift and there is a perfect gift. Remember he's working towards perfection. In my dream there was this small eagle that had all the features of a mature eagle but were anemic and small versus that which is perfect in the slow case, a showcase. Here we have a good gift. It's good, but it's not perfect. And you have the perfect gift. The good gift in the Strongs is just a normal gift that is given. The perfect gift talks about being bestowed on somebody. That means you have reached a point of honor or uh, maturity in the Lord where it's bestowed on you. That's why it's called a perfect gift thing. So Father wants to perfect the gifts he has given us. Right? But he has to deal with that guile. So he is mentioned here as the father of lights and we are called the children of light. So we are from the father of lights and the, those lights in reference to the gifts, those gifts are lights that he gives us and we are children of light. So we as his children, we have light, right? We don't just have the light in us. But he has given us gifts that are as light unto the world. Okay, Matthew 5 says, verse 15 to 16. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we've got the light within us and we have the light of the gifts and calling upon our life. And that's why I'm saying don't hide it under a bushel. I want you to let it shine because many people will be drawn to it and then they will glorify me. They will see your good works that are as light. Okay. So this father of lights, our father, it says there's no variableness in him and no shadow of turning. No variableness is in contrast to the faith that is wavering, that is double-minded. He is in contrast to that. He says, I am faithful. I never change. I am not one day this way and the next day like that. I'm not like your earthly fathers who have proven to you often that you cannot trust them. I'm not like that. I am who I say I am. I am faithful and true and I am the father of lies. And there's no shadow of turning in me. A shadow turns as the sun moves so a shadow turns and he's saying i'm the father of lights i'm the true tree of light that give gifts of light to my children and i do not change you can trust me okay so this lights um, is a state of being we are the children of light focus on children again that innocence without guile so that tells you something. If there's guile in your heart, how will this light, the gift that is given you, shine then? Right? So we are children of light. It's a state of being. It's also this, these lights are gifts. Those gifts are talents or it's the gifts of the spirit. Right? And then it's the gift also is your, the light is also your good works, which is the administration, the office or ministry that is given to you. In whatever form he's given it to you. So in 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about these gifts and administrations. Let's go to verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts. They're different gifts. But the same spirit. Verse 5. And there are differences of administrations. That means the different offices. The fivefold ministry of um Apostle, prophet, um, evangelist, and pastor. Okay, verse 6. And there are diversity of operations. How it operates. The different gifts. 
So these different administrations are given different gifts to operate in. A, a, a prophet often has a, 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 a dreams and visions like Joseph and Daniel, um, but not all of them have dreams and visions. Some of them, uh, 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 if you look at Isaiah, different examples in, in, in the world, many of the prophets didn't have dreams and visions, but others did again, right? Um, then you get teachers. Teachers uh, receive revelation of the word broken up, so they have a spirit of wisdom and knowledge that are given to them. So the different administrations are given different gifts to minister to the body because it's one body. Okay, verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So we all have the Spirit of God once you have given your life to Him. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of the healing of the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another interpretations of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. In other words, he decides who gets what uh, 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 gift. Um, someone recently asked me, you know, what did I pray for or how did I get the, the, the gift of the interpretation of dreams, right? And my question to her was, uh, I didn't answer, I, I, I answered her with a question by saying, what are you going to do with it once you know? What, what are you going to do with it? Because ultimately, if you do not understand what you are called for, then you will easily ask for things that are not necessarily uh, uh, in alignment with your call and what is needed. And that, that can divert you to go into a direction um, that is not the direction that he wants you to go into. So we can ask for gifts. It's important asking for these gifts. He wants to give us gifts, but he knows what we need, right? So he knows what we need for our call. So you can ask him. And let it be. Trust him to give it to you what you need. Okay. So I'm going to tell you now about a vision that I recently had. Um, the subject at hand was very far from my mind. I was just um, in prayer and worshipping him and then I received this vision. So evidently that this was on Father's heart and purposed for this video. So in this vision I saw an open book before me. And Yeshua was paging through this book. I could see him paging through this book. And as I looked on it, I asked him, is this my book? And he gave me no answer. And the next moment, I saw him tearing a page out of the book and just, you know, throwing it to one side. And um, this saddened me when I saw that. And he paged again through it. And then I saw him tearing another page again out of it, just casting it to one side. And he did it a few times. The next moment, I saw him picking up one of these pages and going back to where it was torn out. And he took see-through tape and aligned it to the tear so that it could stick again, together again, right? But I could see the tear in it. And then he took an, another page that he tore out and he did the same. And I again could see the tear in the book. And um, this saddened me a lot. And um, so let me just read what I wrote here. Yeah, that's basically it. And as, as, as the vision ended, I saw a teardrop. It's almost like I could see from his eyes. I saw a, a tear from his eyes falling on one of the pages that he tore. So that is just showing his heart that he wants to reveal. And this is the interpretation of the vision. Or actually, this is what he told me. No interpretation needed. He said to me, Such is my children who do not believe that I will stay true to my promises. They reach a point in waiting, and when they do not see it coming, they simply tear it out of their book. They then lean on their own understanding and try to patch it up by going to someone else. 
However, the tear is clearly seen in their book. I am the giver of all good gifts. I, who am the author and the finisher of their faith, who have written their book, they do not believe. I then saw one teardrop, that's what I said, fall on the torn page in the book and knew that this saddens him greatly. And so later when I read over this vision again, I noticed that the word tear and tear is actually written the same way. And I wonder how many tears have he cried over our book because we do not believe him. But he does actually want to give us promises and gifts and bless us because he is the father of lights. So Psalm 34 tells us, come ye children, come be innocent. Now what do we know about children? Children we often see as gullible, they will believe anything you tell them. But he's saying, come to me, come to me as a child. Believe me, be innocent, be without guile when you come to me. And you know the enemy caught on to that very early and we have a saying that says the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And he knew he has to get to the children in order to influence the whole generation. And once one generation is influenced, it influences a snowball effect to all the different generations. And so he knows the enemy, if he can scar, if he can tear in a book of a child's life, if he can write on the pages of a child's life, through abuse, through slander, through uh, uh, rejection. If he can write on there, he will cause them to believe anything he says because he wrote in their book. And so he writes in our children's books. He writes in there and he's written in many of our books. And we believe the lie. Right? Luke 11. Yeshua says in Luke 11 that we are to be as cunning as snakes and as innocent as doves. And right after that, he says that he sends us as lambs amongst the wolves. So, yeah, once again, a lamb, baby sheep, which points once again as innocence. And dove is also seen as innocence. So, let's just consider the fact that he's saying. Be as innocent as a dove. And then in Isaiah 53, we find that Yeshua is said to have gone before the shearers as dumb as a lamb. He didn't speak. And later on in Isaiah 53, it says that no guile was found on his lips. Okay. So the recent warnings that have gone out is that he's sending us as lambs amongst the wolves. Okay. That we are to be innocent. Um, a picture of children and purity. Then the other one is the tree of lights, the fire of lights, is saying to us that um, that we need to come to Him that has the true gift, and that there will be deception in the time coming, where people will flock to false signs and wonders that will happen because they have not gone to the true tree of lights. They have gone to lean on their own understanding. They've torn the page out of their book and have gone to people. What can you teach me about the gifts? What can you, how can I get this gift? What, what do I have to pay to come into this course? Okay, which course can I take to get this gift, to get this calling, right? And then the flipping the tables, talking about those who are envious, who are anemic in their calling, right? Like that uh, small bird or that small eagle that will start to persecute those who are truly called and who are uh, uh, mature in their walk with the Lord. They will even persecute them. Okay, so these are the warnings that go. So these are very grave warnings for the time that we are going in that we need to take note of. Let's go to Matthew 6. Verse 19, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust, rust do, doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, 
where neither moth nor rust, rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In, um, uh, uh, flipping the tables like uh, Jesus, Sister Donna had this dream where there was uh, uh, a lot of uh, gold coins and they were trafficking with the gifts. It's basically what it's about. And then I mentioned in the interpretation this specific verse that says that we are to have treasures in heaven because in the time to come there will be a famine of not just uh, physical things, the black horse rider, um, but there will be a famine of the word of God. And um, that we are to have a bank in heaven, treasures in heaven, stored up. Okay, so I looked at the word treasure, a promise of treasure in heaven. And the word treasure is G2344. And interesting enough, it means thesaurus. It's the word thesaurus. And I looked up the, uh, 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 the meaning in the uh, uh, Webster's Dictionary. And it says it's a coffer. Uh, the word thesaurus is a coffer or casket in which valuables are kept. A treasury, a deposit, wealth, a storehouse. Interesting, a thesaurus, right? So it's talking about the treasure in heaven. So I said here, considering that he is saying to us to lay up treasures in heaven and that the word treasure means a thesaurus, I first want to give you a short defini definition of the word thesaurus. Okay, and it is a book of words of information about a particular field or set of concepts. So it's a book with a lot of information. It's a treasury, a storehouse. That's what Webster Dictionary says. So now I'm going to share a vision that I had uh, a while ago in uh, 28th of February in 2022. And you will see how this correlates with the treasure in heaven and the word thesaurus. So in this vision, I saw myself walking what looked like a heavenly corridor that was leading to two very big brown oak doors. They had brass or gold round handles, and these doors were very big. I noticed a red carpet, and the moment my feet touched it, I saw knees right alongside me. So I'm stepping on the carpet, and the knees are like here, the knees right by my head. I looked up and saw on either side of the red carpet angels dressed in armor, kneeling, each with a lance, bowing their heads. And I remember that one had long blonde hair, but I could not make out their faces as their heads were bowed. They were very tall, so tall that my head only reached their knees. It was then that I realized that I was as a young child in this vision. The next moment, I saw a hand reach out to me, and as I took Yeshua's hand, he guided me to these two brown oak doors. I also noticed that I was holding my teddy bear. I felt incredibly safe as he was guiding me and noticed the reference the angels had towards him. As we entered through these doors, it was dark. I was only to see that which he wanted me to see. I instantly knew that I was in the treasure room, nothing, noting a treasure chest made of gold and precious stones. I then asked Yeshua, what's in it? Wanting to know what the treasures in heaven are. And as he opened it, I saw the whole chest full of scrolls. I asked him, what are the scrolls? He said, we keep record of everything you have given up for the kingdom. And I saw other treasure chests, knowing that these are these other children's treasure chests. Instinctively, I knew that not all would get the same treasures. It was then that Yeshua reminded me, quoting Luke 18, and he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. Now you will remember that I quoted Psalm 34 and it says, What man is there that desireth life who wants many days? Now that desiring life is not just to be able to breathe. 
It is life. It is he who is life. Right? What man is there that wants this life and to live many days? Okay. So he is saying here, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, that resurrection life, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Okay. If you have that treasure in heaven, if there's a thesaurus in heaven, in your treasure chest, right, that has everything that you've given up for the kingdom of God. Luke 18 verse 15. And they brought unto him also infants, that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Note that in my vision I was a little girl with a teddy bear. Now that teddy bear represents the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and it represents the Holy Spirit who is a comforter. He's my comforter. So he's saying, suffer the little children to come to me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verse 70, verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. He's addressing faith. Math, uh, 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 Luke here is, is saying that we need to come as children to him. And children believe without wavering. There is no guile within their heart. Okay, it is faith perfected. So, the scrolls that I saw in the treasure chest points to the thesaurus. Okay, so in these two visions, in the first one, we see the heart of the Father of Light, of Yeshua, right? Where he cries, with the teardrop over those pages that represents the unbelief of his children who do not come as children to him and believe that he will and wants to bless them and that he has called them. Okay, that's his, where he is at. And then he shows the second vision um, with regards to uh, 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 the, the thesaurus is that he takes, makes record of everything we've given. So it's not just saying, not only does it sadden me when you don't believe, it's I also want you to understand, I take record, I have a record of everything you've given up, and I will reward you. It says in Psalm 34, um, he who seeks the Lord will want no good thing. He who fears the Lord will want no good thing as well. Okay. George Mueller was known for his faith and he was very childlike in his faith. And he said the more he matured in the Lord, the more he became as a child, literally as a child. So evidently being as a child is seen as something very insignificant in this world. But to the kingdom of God, it talks about the perfection of faith, of purity of heart, where there's no guile in the heart. Okay, so just as the Father of lights have no shadow of turning, no variableness, so he desires that within our hearts we will have no shadow of turning. We will not have no variableness. We will truly believe and trust him that he has purposed these things for us and that he wants to give it to us. Okay, so let's go back to James 1. And I said that we're going to speak about these three things, the man of low degree, the rich and temptation. Let's start with the man of low degree. Now, the first thing it says, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Have you ever read that and thought, why is he telling somebody that is in low degree that's being exalted that they need to rejoice? Well, in that time, we need to understand that now the gospel was open to slave and master, Greek and Gentile, or uh, Gentile and Jew. It was open to all uh, different categories of society. There was no distinction anymore, right? And here the slave comes. And the uh, later on, I know James talks to those who are rich and want to sit in the prominent places to, to give it up to those who are more lowly, right? So those of low degrees, they are being exalted. And, and yet James tells them, you need to rejoice. So what we find is that the slaves still have a slave mentality. 
And that is very much the case of many slaves through the years that have been set free, that they still think like slaves. They cannot rejoice in that they've been set free. Okay, so we have the slave and the master and we have the rich and the poor that's being addressed here. So um, this slave mentality comes down to those who think, you know, just be happy with what you have. Don't, don't think that you qualify. It's only those that are super spiritual that get to get these gifts that God uses in such a way. No. He says, I will choose who I will choose. I will have mercy on who I will have mercy. Many have been called from birth, right? I haven't done anything yet. And he has called them already. But the enemy comes then and writes on the slate of their heart, on the book of their heart. And then they start disqualifying themselves because they start having a slave mentality because of all the abuse or uh, 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 rejection that they have endured. All the sorrow that they have endured. Okay, so they have this. They start thinking they 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 are born again, but they still have a slave mentality. They're still bound in their mind, in the strongholds. Right, it's, it's like a ball and chain they carry with them, and so they tend to, to say things like, "I am nothing. I deserve nothing. I can do nothing." And all these things sound very pious, very humble, right? It sounds like the right thing to say because after all, we can do nothing. We do deserve nothing, right? And we are nothing. We are nothing but dust. Or like the rich man, it's just grass that the wind blows. And once it's blown, it place know that it's not where it was before. Okay? That's in Psalm 103. So... But at the heart of it, right, those that are low degree that still have the slave mentality do not believe that God actually loves them the same way he loves others. Yes, they believe he loves them. They can see small ways that he has shown it. But they just cannot get to the point where they believe that he truly loves them that much. They say all the right things and they sound humble, but at the heart of it, they feel immensely inferior. So they cover up that inferiority with a veil of false humility. And that saddens him. Because at the heart of it is a heart, a wicked heart of unbelief. Okay. And what happens a lot with these people is they become passive aggressive. Meaning that they, they act before someone can react to them. In other words, they reject themselves before they can be rejected. So they say, I am nothing. I deserve nothing. I can do nothing because they already believe they are disqualified. So instead of owning up that this is actually inferior, I feel inferior, instead of owning up to that, they cloak it with a religious garb, hiding in the shadows, not wanting to step up to what they've been called to, right? Because they feel inferior. And so they reject themselves before anybody else can reject them. So they hide behind lies that the enemy had told them. And then they do not try new things. To do a new thing is too much for them. They question their motives all the time because they just don't trust themselves. They question themselves. And they don't want to do a new thing. And when they do a new thing, when they start a new project, they never finish it. Because they are self-sabotaging. They sabotage their own actions. They've already decided in their heart and believe already the lies written on the slate of their lives, book. They already believe this will not be a success. They disqualify themselves. And in the process, they lie and deceive themselves. So it's never a question of whether we deserve it because at the heart of it, nobody deserves it. It's a question of who are you looking to? Are you looking at your own inability? Or are you looking to him who has called you and is everything you need so that you will want no good thing? But it's because of the guile in your mouth that you disqualify yourself. It speaks of your unbelief.
which saddens him greatly. Okay. I wrote here, you do not hear and see as you ought because you are still veiled by the lies of the enemy and have bought into it. You struggle to hear him. You struggle to see. You struggle to discern because you are focused on yourself, thinking you are focused on him because you're saying all the right things. But secretly, you struggle with the fact that you do not hear him, that you do not see as you ought to see. And it becomes a burden unto you. Okay, let's go to the rich again. They are brought to a lower state, right? As they go to the opposite side of the pendulum. So what we have is we have the low degree, okay? Those that disqualify themselves. Then we have the rich. And the rich are the other side of the pendulum. And what is holding the pendulum is inferiority, right? So a pendulum, by extension, swings. So you will find both of these characteristics. If you have inferiority, you will disqualify yourself in, in areas, but at the same time, you will qualify yourself or you will boast. Right. So a pendulum is holding. This is that guile in your heart. is holding these actions. And it is sabotaging the call upon your life. So the rich again, they boast of everything the Lord shows them. There's just no end to their boasting. Everything has to be reported. Okay, They overcompensate and justify why they say something. Why it's from the Lord. It's because they feel inferior. Okay, And they compare themselves with others. Yet the word says that we are not to compare ourselves with man. And secretly they are envious in their heart when they see other people being used by God. Because they too want to be used like that. And so in their heart there's envy and then slander starts to happen. They start to persecute them. Not necessarily by exposing or wanting to expose that person. But sometimes it's just in their heart or they will talk about that person to somebody else. Okay. So that person, that other person, is becomes like a thorn in their inferior flesh. That's what it boils down to. That they cannot, they don't like that person. They are green with envy, so to speak. So what they also tend to do is, their focus is on man. So when you compare yourself with man, that means man is your standard. You focus on man. Will I get approved? Will I get subscribers? Will I get likes? Um, what, what, was, what is my comment? comments? Um, um, how do they respond? Your focus is what man will say, right? And so you tend to placate to man's desires. Or you go to the opposite side and you like, like to antagonize. You like to provoke people because then you can be seen as one who fights for the truth. Then you can be seen one as non-negotiable when it comes to the truth. Then you can be seen as one who do not fear man. But in truth, in reality, you're using that uh, 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 antagonism as a, uh, uh, a foundation or a platform to be praised. Once again, pointing to inferiority. So you, you traffic with the gifts with the visions, with the dreams, with the things that Father gives you. You traffic with it so that you can get applause, so that you can feel better about yourself. So you get on the one side that, the, that people use the gifts and the callings of God, what He has given us as a platform to get praise. And then the other side, you get those that disqualify themselves, but they want and desire these gifts and callings and talents. And these very two dispositions is what will set those who are in those dis dispositions to fall for deception when the signs and wonders come from the Antichrist and the false prophet that the word says will deceive many, even the elect. That disposition, that guile in the heart will cause many to fall away apart from many fearful things that will happen. At 
the heart of it, the gifts and the callings that are coveted is tantamount to feeling approved and loved and accepted. That which the enemy uh, uh, wrote upon their hearts that disqualified them in their own minds, right? Causing them to act the way they do. When Father gives them gifts and callings, they then feel loved. They then feel approved. They feel wanted. They feel that they are in good standing. But your gift and your calling does not, uh, 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 is not an indication of your right standing with God because his gifts and his callings, is uh, he does not call it back. He will never take it back. Once he gives you a gift, it's yours. But is your gift, is your calling being sabotaged by the gall in your heart? And how much of your, your gift and your calling um, are you walking in? You see, that, that eagle that he showed me, what he was showing me is unless we deal with this guile and kill it, you will never walk in the fullness, that showcased eagle, of what I have called you to. You will forever be this. Yes, you will have all the features of a mature eagle, of a mature calling that you've been called to, of the gift, everything like that. But it will be sick and anemic. It will not have the sense of me. It will have the sense of you. I want to share a dream that Maya Duran, it's a friend of mine, that she um, dreamed and just exactly at the time that Father was showing me all of these things. So I want to share this dream and you can see just the, the, the disposition of, of Maya and in the dream and the disposition of the woman in the dream as well that speaks to what I've just shared as well. So reading her dream. I was watching this group of dancers and there was a boy in a robin's egg blue shirt dancing with such skill, such gracefulness and beautiful to watch. I walked over to some of my family and made mention of him about how great he is. Okay, the family is the church there. Then the group of dancers starts walking to a football field and it is night time. The field lights are on, but they have walked off into a part that is enveloped in darkness. It's so dark that I lose track of them. I cannot find them anymore, but on my search for them, I come up on this neighborhood. I came to a house in the middle of a cul-de-sac made of bricks. I knock and a little girl answer. She's about five years old. We are talking and playing in this indoor pool that is in her house. The pool is big as for a swim team and for swimming laps. It's long and rectangular and I pretend that I'm going to drop her in as she hangs onto my hands. We are both laughing. It's a fun time, just playing around and then I hear her mom come. She's about as irate as they come. That I'm there. She replays me on the cameras that she had in her house. And she sees me with her daughter, but without audio. It looks like I'm harming her daughter and being creepy. Then she really loses it and I make it out the front door. I hear her opening the front door to see where I went. And I stop running and hide. I watch to see what she does and she goes back into her house. Okay, so the interpretation of the dream. This dream underscores what was just said. The dancers and the little boy speaks of those given gifts and talents from the Lord, being as children. In a way, our gifts and talents are as children that we have, to have responsibility to look after. The boy speaks of innocence and must still grow, even though he is graceful in dancing. Right? These dancers and boy go over to the football field. This speaks of the field of the world and the fact that it's a football field points to feet, which speaks of being sent out to preach the gospel. How blessed are the, or beautiful are the feet of those who brings good tidings. That's the scripture. Being in the dark whilst in the, the field lights are on speaks of not wanting any lime light on them. And Maya loses track of them, which is the whole purpose. The focus is to be God. 
The brick house is the house of God. The cul-de-sac speaks of the fact that these gifts come from out of the house of God. The five-year-old gold speaks of grace, the number five, and being childlike, just like the boy in the robin's egg blue top. Now, Robin means famous and bright, a variant of Robert the Bruce, which means bright fame, pointing to gifts being light from the father of lights, right? Because they were dancing. Herein you see how they let their light so shine that the world, the football field, sees their good works and glorifies the father in heaven. The Olympic-sized pool speaks of being trained up in the word of God, which is what the water in the pool represents. Playing with the little girl speaks of Maya's childlike heart, but also enjoying the gift of another. The mom clearly shows her inferiority and envy that someone dare enjoy her gift or share in the same gift. She lashes out and accuses her falsely, being very suspicious and slandering her not having any proof, not having any audio. She goes by what she sees, showing her inability to discern correctly or not having an ear to hear. She didn't have an audio on the video of what she saw. So the video is a reference to being able to discern. So she's discerning incorrectly what Maya is doing, right? The gift. She's discerning incorrectly and therefore she's slandering her she's thinking she's doing the work of god that's what the word says they will cast you before magistrates and into prison thinking that they are serving god so here's this woman out of the church and she's slandering her because she's discerning the video what she sees and it doesn't have audio which means she's not hearing what god is saying and Isaiah 11, he says, he doesn't discern by what he sees or hear, but he judges righteously. Okay. Maya hiding and watching to see what she does points to be aware of those who are like them. Be on the watch for those who come out of the church with this inferiority. So then we're going to go to blessed is the man in James 1 that endureth temptation for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So I just spoke about the fact that this tempt temptation is both the trials, the difficult things we're going through, where our faith is, is brought to perfection of that of the innocence of a child so that we will want nothing, that there will be no guile, the guile that I spoke about in our hearts, that inferiority, right? And um, But that this temptation is also uh, uh, the enemy tempting us. Just think of Joseph. How he was tempted by um, Potiphar's wife, which is a type and shadow of Jezebel. She's an adulterous woman, right? And she's, she's saying, come lay, lay with me. And, and, and what I want to say here is when you can be at the height of your ministry and very susceptible to temptation. Because you can feel, I can stand on my own. I will not fall for this obvious sin. God will keep me. This will never happen to me. It's easy to think that you have reached that point, right? So on the other side, you have those who have suffered so much. They've been like Joseph in the jail or in the dungeon. They've suffered so much. They've endured so much that they fall for the temptation to start to indulge in things. I deserve this. I can give myself this. Whether it's the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes or the pride of life. Those three temptations never go away. So when you're at the height of your ministry, you're susceptible to this. And when you're at the lowest of, 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 of being tested and tried, you're also susceptible to this. Because you will, you will want to be lenient with yourself and give this soul, this flesh who do, does not want to die, a break. Because after all, you've endured so much. Right? And you will open that can of worms and you will eat it. And you will embrace depression. Because after all, it's your blanket. It's your comfy blanket. Nobody can point a finger at you and say, well, shame, you've endured so much, you know, and tell you to get out of it. Snap out of it. After all, you can't snap out of it. You've gone through so much. But everybody goes through a hell of a lot. Everybody goes through things. But there comes a point where you say, this blanket, I'm taking off. 
because I'm sabotaging myself and I'm sabotaging the call of God upon my life. The same goes for those who think they stand. The word says pride comes before a fall. Okay? And something Father told me, it's a pearl of wisdom that he gave me um, years ago, and he said to me, just as humil humility is vital for holiness, so approval of man for pride. Say that again. Just as humility is vital for holiness, so approval of man for pride. We place no confidence in the flesh. We seek not the approval of man. And if you have this inferiority in your heart, if you still think that God doesn't love you or you don't deserve or you are nothing and that whole mantra, or you think you have to overcompensate by constantly boasting about what he has shown you and all those things, right? Then you still seek the approval of man. I want to share a dream that I had as well that points to um, this fearing what man will say and also the disposition that is needed with regards to ministry. It's called the halibut dream. Okay. I dreamed that I was visiting a friend of mine called Liesel. In this dream she lived on a farm and when I arrived I saw her standing inside in camp with an ostrich and she was very friendly with this ostrich and the ostrich had his head in the sand. I noticed that lions were circling the camp and went inside the house. They don't want to be near the lions. My husband, Daniel, that's his name, was standing outside, not the least phased by these lions. And I called for him to come in and both he and Liesel came inside. It was then that I noticed the lions circling the house looking at me. They looked very thin and anemic. I was very scared of them and I asked Liesel whether she saw them. So I was actually sitting on a bed when I saw them. The whole house were made of windows. Okay, the walls were windows. Liesel then told me, be careful of those lions. And when I looked at them, I saw that they had human teeth. The next moment, we are ordering takeaways. Danny and Liesel orders McDonald's and I ordered halibut. And when the takeaways came, I was disgusted to see how greasy the hamburgers was and how oily and burnt the chips that were thrown on top of books within a box. So here comes the takeaway. I get halibut. They get greasy hamburgers and oily burnt chips on top of books. Okay. So that's the end of the dream. Here's the interpretation. This dream came just before I started to post on YouTube. This is why the house is made of glass. So it talks about being in the open in the same way as the eagle in my dream was about, was about a showcase. You are in the open for everybody to see. Liesel's name means gift of God. So she represents the gifts of God, which points to the gifts the Father has given me and that he is telling me to not bury my gifts in the sand in the same way he told the disciples in Matthew 6, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Okay, so he doesn't want us to hide our gifts. It was the time for me to, to become more public in ministry. Now Daniel, my husband, often used by father to speak in a dream of my heavenly husband, as my heavenly husband, is there in the capacity as the one who protects me from the lions. This is why he was not afraid of them, pointing to Daniel, who was known for his dreams and interpretations cast into the dungeon with the lions. The lions with the human teeth point to the persecution that will come from those who are anemic in their ministry and envious. I am to stay in his rest, being seated on the bed, and not fear the lion's faces. I am not to fear man. The takeaway food points to the temptation. Food is synonymous with temptation as Adam and Eve were drawn away because of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life by a fruit. Now remember I spoke about um, these temptations that come to those who have this inferiority that's holding the pendulum of their life, that they come because they lust of the gifts and, and callings. They covet it. 
because they want to for, for, they want to use it for their own purposes because then I feel loved then I feel appreciated then God approves of me okay so it's it's presented as a fruit right fruit in temptation points to sexual desires or lust as was the case with Joseph and Potiphar's wife whether it's the lust of the eyes or the lust of the flesh the McDonald's points to that which is fast and cheap but ultimately defiles and have no nutritional value. The saying you are what you eat is applicable here. The books on which this greasy food is, is speaking of that I will teach. What you take into your body matters to him, whether through your eyes, ears or mouth. It matters to him from which table you eat. So here Daniel representing Yeshua and Liesel representing the Holy Spirit giving the gifts are being defiled. The books, the teachings are being made one with that which I eat because I am in them and they are in me. Right? So it's being defiled. He's saying stay away from these things. Do not be caught in the trap of inferiority where you seek the things of the Spirit as well fleshly things that, that are tempted temptations to us right okay the halibut i ate halibut it was the first time i ever heard of halibut in my dream i've never heard of the word halibut i had to look it up not knowing what kind of fish this is and the reason for halibut is pointing to the nutritional value of fish as well as the fact that the halibut means holy fish that's what it means it speaks of being separated and being set apart unto god this speaks also the halibut fish is a fish that swims on the lower level of the sea. It speaks of humility, right? Think of Yeshua's robe when he walked into my bedroom in my dream about the eagle. It is also a flat fish, once again speaking of lowliness, keeping a low profile, if you will. The halibut's eyes also look up, okay? Which points to only looking to him, not to man, not to myself, only looking to him. In this dream, Father was warning me of the different dangers on the road ahead and that I am to look only to Him. That humility and looking to Him, not to people or myself, is of utmost importance. And this is what He's saying to us as well. This inferiority, right, whether you are disqualifying yourself or boasting with everything He shows you, the focus is self. The focus is on you, which points to pride, right? And the golden calf comes in many forms. This inferiority causes you to serve self, no matter how you confess that you serve him. Yeshua said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold on to the one and despise the other. He also said, he whom you serve, is your master. So if your eyes look only to yourself, right, and you serve yourself, then yourself is your master, the idol upon your heart. This is how serious this is. This is why he wants us to deal with guile, because guile, in the end, actually points to serving self. And you cannot serve him wholeheartedly, while serving yourself and him. It must be one or the other. Proverbs 4 said, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. Right? So deception comes not necessarily only because we do not know uh, a particular lie that is spoken to us. Deception comes because of the lust, the desires of our heart. That's how deception comes. We are drawn away by the lust of our heart, whether that's lust for spiritual things or whether that is lust for physical things. It's still lust and it draws us away from our pure devotion to him. That's where deception takes place, within the heart. Okay, We are drawn away by it. Yeshua said in Matthew 5, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The, purity, the, 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 the issue of seeing God, the issue of discernment, the issue of understanding and wisdom and revelation 
of our eyes being opened up is the issue of the heart, of our ears being opened up, because we, we see and perceive through the filters of our heart, that which is still undealt with. If you're still dealing with these things, are still an issue, this guile is still within your heart. It will influence your ministry. It will influence your seeing, your speaking, your hearing. It will be filtered through that thinking. And he wants to deal with it. Because unless you deal with that guile, you will never walk in the full calling that he has apprehended you for. Never in the fullness. You will automatically disqualify yourself from that fullness. You might still have the gifts, but not the fullness. Not the perfect gift. You will have the good gift, but not the perfect gift. And he wants the perfect gift for you. He wants the perfect gift for me. Okay. And this is why some people's ministries are still anemic. They lack the sense of God. Jeremiah 17 says, verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That little spider is very small. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of of his doings, he keeps, he, he shows in the treasure, the scrolls in the treasure chest. You know, we, the word says that we eat the fruit of our mouth. And this made me think of uh, um, at what table are we eating, right? What table? Remember in, in the halibut dream, Daniel and Liesel representing uh, uh, Yeshua and the Holy Spirit eating this greasy food, this teaching, okay? And it becomes one. You are what you eat. It becomes one with them. This takes me to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 21 says, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils, okay? You become one with that table. as a, The sacrifice on the altar, that table as an altar, is one. And so when you partake of the table of idols, you make yourself one with the altar. And we have a different altar. It's called the cross. It is at that table we are seated. And in Proverbs 9, we hear wisdom calling. And she said she's hewn out her seven pillars, the seven churches. And she set a table. She's made a feast. Come drink of my wine. Come eat of my bread that I have set for you. Right? There's the invitation of the Father saying, come sit here by me. Come, come drink and eat of my table. The table of your heart where I have sit before your enemies. Then further on you read of the foolish woman. And she's sitting and screaming out whoever passes by. You know, you're the lucky one chosen for today. Stolen waters and stolen bread. Those are quick fixes. The page that were torn out. That he cries and says, they don't believe me, so they go lean on their own understanding and go to others. Let's go to this sermon. Let go, let's go to this course. Let's read this book. Quick fixes. They do not want to stay on the altar of God and feast on the cross. Because it will require them to deal with the guile upon their heart. Okay. So the question is, from which altar are you eating? What is written on the table of your heart, in your book? Whose call did you answer? And whose call are you answering today? Are you living from the lies of the enemy or from your youth side? You've carried it all along you, everything that you've gone through, your divorce, your sexual abuse and molestation, the rapes that took place, the sorrow, people that have died in your life, all the broken relationships, friends that have left you, and the scars that have left on your heart, and then you decided you're going to tear that page out because ultimately it means you're not meant for this. You'll just keep a low profile. Profile. Are you eating at the table set before you in the presence of your enemies? 
where he can send you out from. That's what Psalm 23, that table, if you look at the meanings of it, it means to sit at least at the king's table to receive kingly authority in order to be sent out. Are you sitting at that table? And do you have any, do you now wonder why you're not being sent out? If you have not been sitting at that table, at which table, at which altar are you sitting and you feasting from? You know, when I was busy with this and Father was breaking this bread open to me to eat from, he said these words to me, he said, bind the sacrifice to the altar. And I was thinking, okay, that must be somewhere in Leviticus. Um, obviously it is. Um, and But he directed me to Psalm 118 and it says, in verse 27 it says, God is the Lord which have showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even unto the horns of the altar. Bind the sacrifice. I want to read a commentary. I looked up a commentary on Psalm 118 verse 27, and I found a commentary of the man called T.H. Howard. Never heard of him before, but I like what he said. And this uh, commentary is called Bound to the Altar. I just want to read it. Some time ago, I went with the general to Stockholm where the Swedish officers were gathered together for their annual congress. Now, the general, I'm thinking, is probably um, General Booth from the Salvation Army. Okay. I need not... Okay, let me just read it again. Some time ago, I went with the general to Stockholm where the Swedish officers were gathered together for their annual congress. I need not dwell at any great length upon the word altar. I refer to the table in our altar service as the place of gifts. It's also the place of dedication and the place of sacrifice. Thank God it has been so to many as well as the mercy seat where God has sealed the acceptance of the offering presented to him. How often have we been reminded of that altar of sacrifice in the shape of the accursed cross where the Savior made atonement for our sins and it is in reality at that altar we bow. The horns were the corner posts, and sometimes the worshipper presenting a living creature would tether it with a cord to the altar's horn, so that the gift could be used either for sacrifice or service. In both cases, the figure of speech seems to imply the possibility of the consecration being reversed by the withdrawal of the offering, or broken by its loss the sacrifice slipping off or away from the altar or being loosened by the person who had presented the offering. The psalmist therefore urges those to whom he is speaking to maintain their consecration and to see to it that their sacrifice is not taken off the altar after being put on. These corner posts were not there for ornaments but for use and the cords were attended to hold the sacrifice to the altar so that it could not be snatched away. What I want to emphasize by this is that those who come with gifts and dedication should bind themselves in terms of un unalterable covenant. They should stand to their consecration when loss or pain or temptation come. And come they will in one form or another. It is just here where so many fail. They do not really maintain their sacrifice. That is to say, having made a consecration, they do not stand to it. The offering has been made, but it's been taken back again. The vow has been registered, but not paid. The promise has been made, but not fulfilled. The consecration has been broken or reversed. Take that wonderful scene in the life of Abram. At the command of God, he erected an altar cut the sacrifices in pieces and laid it there. Then Abram waited for the coming of the fire. Before the fire came, or anything happened, the vultures, those unclean birds, the temptations, were circling around his head and around the altar, trying to defile the sacrifice or snatch it away or devour it. The story says that when the birds came, Abram drove them away, those thoughts. And he stood to his covenant until the fire came. The vultures of temptation will circle around you. They will try to frighten you and to remove the sacrifice wholly or partially or to defile it in some way. Your business then is to drive them away, 
to bind and rebind the sacrifice to God's altar. God is waiting for a whole burnt offering from us and that we will remain on that altar and bind ourselves to our heart to the uh, with cords to the horns on the altar those horns represent our left the ox that he may be our strength and that whilst we are on that altar and he sends the fire we in our weakness are bound to the strength of the ox never looking to ourselves 1 Corinthians 10 says, For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifice, partakers of the altar. Just as you become a partaker of this, eat the sacrifice that's on an altar and then become part of that altar, what is spoken over you and you believe it, and you give your life to all the lies of the enemy, you become one with that in the same way. When you choose to become a whole burnt offering and you bind yourself to the altar of the cross, you become one with Christ, you become one with the altar. That is what he seeks, a whole burnt offering. And when that sacrifice is on that altar, the high priest comes and he comes with the sword of the spirit and he divides between bone and marrow. He goes, he divides between soul and spirit and he discerns between the intents, the thoughts and the motives of the heart and it will hurt. He will go deep into that very essence and he will remove the guile within you if you stay put, if you bind the sacrifice to the altar. I want to end here with a word that Father has given me. It's called without guile. Listen carefully to the admonition given. When I have your tongue, I have you. Once you confess with a mouth that is not hot or co and cold, one that knows assuredly without any doubt what I've called you to, and you accept and embrace it with your whole being, it is then that I can send you. If any part in you still does not buy into what I've prepared for you and you doubt, I cannot send you. Or use you as I intended and purposed. Your lips must be without guile before I can send you. This is not merely a confession, but from out of the heart one speaks. And so the issue of your lips is the issue of your heart. I alone search the heart of man and know it through and through. I try the heart of man to see if they are true and whether they are without guile. How can two walk together unless they agree? And yet you need to walk not only with me, but walk in the knowing that we are one. My nature in you, expressed by what you will do. For it is not just what you will do that will express my glory and who I am, but who you are in yourself, one with me. How can two walk together unless they agree? There can be no guile on your lips and in your walk. Called to walk vitally united to my spirit in all you do. This requires a spirit that is without guile. Be zealous, therefore, to root out all guile, all that which will hinder you from running this race and fulfilling my purpose lest you be disqualified and bring shame upon yourself. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Humble yourself, therefore, search your heart, and I will lift you up and use you. Then I will send you. Let those who have ears hear what the Spirit is saying to those who are sabotaging their call and the purpose that God has in store for them. May you earnestly seek him for this to reveal any of guile in your heart and choose and remain and bind yourself to the altar as a whole burnt offering to be consumed with fire so that his glory may be made manifest in you. Amen. Bless you.